Hello, everybody, and welcome to my presentation on the phylogenetic placement of Dickinsonia, an enigmatic creature that existed before life as we know it really bloomed into existence. In this presentation, I want to introduce you to the Precambrian environment, briefly describe Dickinsonia's morphology, and then present the prevailing theories for its phylogenetic position. For this, I need to take you back in time, back before the giant millipedes and dragonflies of the Carboniferous colonized the land and sky, back before the trilobites swarmed the sea floor during the Cambrian explosion, all the way back to the unfamiliar pre-Cambrian world of the Ediacaran 580 million years ago. During the Ediacaran period, photosynthetic algae bloomed in enormous microbial mats covering the sandy shallows all around the world. It was on these dense mats that new multicellular life emerged, grazing on these algal pastures like invertebrate cows. These strange creatures were outcompeted by their descendants and disappeared entirely from the fossil record about 540 million years ago. Understanding animal life during these formative years really helps put this entire course into a clearer evolutionary context. So for the next 10 minutes, I want you to dive into the warm Ediacaran shallows with me and explore the phylogenetic position of this guy, Dickinsonia. Dickinsonia was an unusual organism by modern standards. It was completely soft-bodied and large, with some specimens reaching up to like four and a half feet long. At one end uh, was this wedge-shaped segment known as the deltoid region. In this region, it lacked any visible sensory structures like eyes or antennae or even chemoreceptors that were visible. It had no mouth or anus and was just a few millimeters thick, lacking any differentiation between its dorsal and ventral surfaces. It also did most of its feeding through external digestion, uh, carving these Dickinsonia-shaped grooves into the algae beneath it as it moved. These fossilized tracts moved towards the deltoid region, indicating that it had some sense of awareness about its environment and some sense of direction, at least. This movement was likely uh, similar to that of flatworms and acials, powered by ciliary gliding and changes in direction being powered by true muscle. Dickinsonia's most obvious feature and the largest problem for its classification was actually its segmentation. Dickinsonia's segments were arranged around a midline groove. You see it in purple. Unlike any animal that you'd see today, however, these segments were not arranged symmetrically. They had this glide radial symmetry, or glide symmetry, an offset bilateral symmetry where individual segments don't touch at the midline, just like the veins on a leaf that you see right there. So for decades, this segmentation pattern caused many scientists to classify Dickinsonia as a lichen or bryophyte, and uh, this was only shown to be false when fossilized cholesterols were found in the fossils of Dickinsonia. So we now know that this segmentation pattern reflected an unusual growth mode, where segments were released one at a time from the back, as is shown here, slowly stacking together to elongate the animal over time. So when it was first discovered, Dickinsonia was thought to be some sort of benthic tenophore or cnidarian due to its assumed radial symmetry and its soft body. As we learned earlier in this course, ancient tenophores like the one on the left had a great deal of variability in their numbers of comb rows. So it was actually an attractive hypothesis to interpret these segments as ciliary bands that were sort of emanating from the midline. At the time, it was believed that Dickinsonia's segments extended from the midline like spokes on a wheel and expanded as it grew, but now we know that this was actually a way to extend the animal. In addition, there's no evidence of a GVC opening, tentacles, or a statocyst in Dickinsonia, and it was not a predator, which is the main lifestyle of tenophores. So Dickinsonia probably lacked coloblasts, which are synapomorphic for tenophores. Another popular but misguided hypothesis is that Dickinsonia was an annelid, very similar to the genus Spinther, a sponge symbiont. You see Spinther on the uh, left there and Dickinsonia on the right. This is a beautiful example of convergent evolution. Two animals with similar sluggish kind of lifestyles generating the same exact body plan. However, Spinther shares all the key annelid characteristics. A prostomium, peristomium, eyes, hardened mouth parts, keti, a gut, and clean bilateral symmetry. An annelid characterization of Dickinsonia would require a loss of basically every single annelid trait, a massive dorsoventral flattening, 
the loss of this bilateral symmetry, the gain of glide radial symmetry, all 40 million years before the first documented annelid even appears on the fossil record. Um, I actually did this project because I learned in a class that Dickinsonia was an annelid, and I was like, there's no way. There's no way. At least that's what I think. I don't know. What do you think? All right, so with that out of the way, I want to examine two possibilities that appear to have the most merit in my opinion. First, that Dickinsonia was a placozoan, and second, that it was a stem bilaterian. Placozoans are tiny, about a thousand cells big, and they lack visible dorsoventral differentiation. They have this blob-like, oval-shaped appearance, and they're very, very thin. They create a external digestion chamber underneath their ventral side and absorb nutrients through their skin. All of these characteristics match very cleanly with Dickinsonias. In addition, genetic sequencing of placozoans showed that they express a single Hox gene, TROX2. Expression of Hox genes is crucial for body patterning and organization. TROX2 expression in modern placozoans suggests that ancestral placozoans may have been way more complex and organized than they currently are, and that they lost many Hox genes in their miniaturization over the years. This is where the problems with this hypothesis come in. This hypothesis explains away Dickinsonia's morphological characters that don't really make sense by saying that they were lost in miniaturization. These include that it grew up to four and a half feet long, had a clear and conserved plane of symmetry, coordinated movement in a single direction, had true muscles, and performed longitudinal elongation of its body by adding segments in. All these features seem to point to an early bilaterian. For decades, people have tried to shoehorn Dickinsonia into the tree of life, this beautiful tree that we see before us right here. These are the living groups of animals that we have all come to know and love over the past few years. However, each branch on our big tree has hundreds of dead twigs coming off of it, filled with the thriving species that just couldn't compete with the powerhouses that came after them. Dickinsonia belonged to this much richer tree. That's the tree of death. So the last hypothesis I want to present is that Dickinsonia was a stem bilaterian from the tree of death, diverging and differentiating from our lineage before the common ancestor of all modern bilaterians. Its deltoid zone in this hypothesis was a primitive head, with delicate sensory organs that were lost in preservation. This would explain why it moved consistently towards its deltoid region, sensing its way across the algal mats towards greener pastures. This hypothesis suggests that glide segmentation was an early, failed way of elongating the body along the anterior-posterior axis. Dickinsonia's musculature would also be explained by this hypothesis, suggesting that triploblasty evolved really, really early in the divergence of bilaterians. The key issue with this hypothesis is Dickinsonia's lack of GVC and its external digestion. It is possible that Dickinsonia's ancestor developed an expanded digestive syncytium, more exposed than that of aceals. By gaining external digestion, it was able to use the vast algal planes of the ediacaran and increased its body size to maximize the contact of this surface with its food source. In summary, Dickinsonia was an ediacaran animal whose phylogenetic position is still unclear. While many elements of its body plan appear to be convergent with tenophores and annelids, mischaracterizations of Dickinsonia as a worm or jelly still persist in the scientific literature. The placements I find most appealing are a placozoan affinity, which requires a loss of body organization through miniaturization, and a stem bilaterian affinity, which would require the loss of a GVC in Dickinsonia's earliest ancestor. So what are you most convinced by? Are there any phylogenetic positions that I didn't mention that you think have merit? I would love to hear your ideas in the discussion board. Thank you so much for listening.